Book Two, Soldier at the Door, Chapter 16. But Bears Don't Innovate. Mari was hanging the laundry out on the line in the back garden when she saw Grampy Neeks jogging down the main port road. She waved to him and he cut down the alley. Mrs. Shin, he nodded as he approached. And where are you off to on this beautiful afternoon? Off to be rescued, of course. He grinned playfully, his gnarled face adding even more distinctive wrinkles. Mari knew he had forgiven her for softening the soldiers earlier in the week. Rumors had got back to her, via her mother, naturally, that a few older single women thought the poor master sergeant looked like he needed some fattening up, and maybe even some tender loving care, and would Mari know if he were available? Until Mari could be sure of just how old Grampy Neeks was, she didn't know which of the names to pass along to him. Perrin's claim that Grampy was only in his early 40s seemed preposterous, and his further claim that he would not become involved in Grampy's potential love life, so don't you dare think of asking me, Mari, was also disappointing. But yesterday, Mari mentioned to Grampy in passing that a few of the edge women were interested in him, especially those who, especially one who he had helped with a stubborn catch in a tree on Get to Know Your Friendly Soldiers Day. Grampy had looked pleasantly startled by that and said, Well, since she reminded me so much of my own dear grandmother, Mari had been too stunned by that response to know how to proceed with suggesting that he pay her a visit. Perhaps she wasn't cut out for making matches, but at least Grampy was smiling at her again. I heard you're the first victim, and I can hardly wait, Mari chuckled. So who's running the first race to edge? Grampy raised his eyebrows. Zenas got you calling it too? I got him calling it that. Perrin wouldn't come up with anything more interesting, so I named it myself. Grampy grinned. Well, the whole fort is calling stage two the race now, much to the Major's disapproval. Zenas is a good gossip, Mari nodded in approval, and I thought the soldiers might enjoy getting to know every corner of Edge if they realized it was a race. Get egos involved, and I've discovered men will do just about anything. Indeed they do, Neeks laughed. Race starts in about half an hour, so you sit on your front porch with the little ones and enjoy the chaos. How many is he starting with? Mari asked. Three pairs today, with himself, Karna, and Gazada following them on horseback. You know how the Major likes to shout his little bits of encouragement to the men. Neek said it soberly, but with a twinkle in his eyes. Mari grinned. Which means if any of the men get lost, he'll be hoarse with screaming at them by the time they find and rescue you. Oh, I'm counting on it. I made the first location exceptionally confusing, so I fully expect to see at least two veins bulging in his neck. No one does angry quite like a shin. Neek drawled with devious anticipation. Have a good afternoon, Mrs. Shin, and he continued his jog into Edge. Mari rubbed her face. Oh, boy, hope Perrin gets it all out of him by the time he comes home tonight. Half an hour later, Mari sat eagerly on her front porch with Jaitsi and Pato fresh from their naps and cheered as the first racers ran past her house. Perrin on horseback followed closely and was already shouting. Mrs. Hirsch pulling weeds out of her garden and subtly tossing them over into the weeds, the shin's overgrown yard, looked up in alarm. An attack? She called to Mari. No, Mari chuckled. It's stage two, the race to edge. It's been announced at the amphitheater for the past few days. Mrs. Hirsch nodded slowly as if she just remembered. Another two soldiers ran past, with Karna following them and yelling. Oh my, Mrs. Hirsch mumbled. Mari giggled to herself. I wonder how much of Edge forgot. I suppose they'll remember just as quickly. That night, when Perrin came home, he was all smiles. It went that well, Mari said. Not exactly, he scowled briefly, but in hindsight, it was amusing. I saw Grampy on his way to the village. He said he made the first location purposefully confusing. Perrin grinned. He sent the soldiers to find the tailors. Oh, Mari began to chuckle. Which one? 
That's when it got interesting. Perrin laughed. All six of them ran straight for the tailor shop where they do the alterations for the army, but no master sergeant. Oh, no. So, after terrifying the customers in the shop by running around frantically to find Neeks, they all rushed out of it and into the next tailor shop filled with women. Mari burst out laughing. After several screams, Perrin continued chuckling. The six of them ran out of that shop. I'm guessing no one in Edge remembered about the race today. Not that I could tell. The market was in full panic. And you were there on horseback, screaming at the soldiers, right? Of course I was, Perrin exclaimed. It was embarrassing. The soldiers started hysterically running into every shop, looking under every cart, and one even looked under a hat on display as if Neeks could be hiding under it. Mari was laughing so hard, she was wiping tears off her face. So where was he? Taylor's sweet shop. He was sucking on his second syrup drop and sitting on a stool in the middle of the shop by the time the soldiers finally found him. I'll tell you, he has the head shaking and disappointment motion down to an art form. I should have followed the soldiers, Mari laughed. At least it wasn't Gazada in there or the sweet shop would have been cleaned out. So when's the second race to Edge? Day after tomorrow, and Magistrate Cockalorum better be ready. I already sent him a message that he's going to be saved. Two days later, Olive Edge was ready. Mari wasn't the only one sitting on her porch with her children. The whole neighborhood was cheering on the runners as they ran through Edge on their way to the south of the village. Perrin and Karna on horseback, following the chase and shouting. Mari knew the best entertainment had just arrived in Edge. Soon everyone would catch on, too. And by the end of the week, they had. Perrin came home for dinner and announced, Now we're getting requests for soldiers to run through family parties, surprise someone for their birthday, or terrify a relative visiting from somewhere else. He tried to say it with exasperation, but his eyes were shining. Well done again, Major, Mari grinned and kissed him. Although I do have a question about a certain home invasion two of my after-school care students told me about. Perrin chuckled. Yes, that. It seems to save some time two soldiers ran through a house, even stealing a turkey leg in the process and tracking mud from the back door to the front. Mrs. Pierce was not amused when she came up to the fort to complain. But her sons were. Now all of the boys want to be on your roots. And really, it might be a good idea to accommodate some of those requests, she hinted. Remind the citizens the soldiers are there for them. Perrin shrugged. Perhaps, perhaps. Even if they shout the wrong directions at times, the villagers have been good about the soldiers running and jumping over their fences and going through their gardens. So far, Corporal Zenas has won the three races he's, ran, he's run. Every soldier wants a chance at either being his partner or beating him. Sounds like a good motivational tool, Major, she decided, as long as there's no wagering. Only bragging rights. And I never realized a man could be so humble in bragging. Shem's an unusual person. Mari wrapped her arms around him. And so are you, Major Shin. So... One more success? He nodded. And then I think Edge just might be as safe as I can make it, aside from building a massive stockade fence around it. <clears throat> Two men sat in the dark room of an unlit building. Races? Mal asked. Races? Brizik nodded. Quite progress, I mean, innovative, don't you think? Even new soldiers can find their way around with his labeling system. I wondered that no one thought of this before. Perhaps the intensity of the raids has pushed him to such tactics. Are you suggesting that we've caused this? Mal bristled. Brzezek shrugged with a smile. I suppose we have. He's become quite the aggressive bear, hasn't he? But bears don't innovate. They fight. They designate territories. Isn't that what he's doing? Improving the army's ability to fight, marking his territory. Mal groaned in frustration. He's making things very difficult. 
This was completely unanticipated. Brizek waved that off. So then we innovate. Counter his movements. It's like a game of dices. He makes a call. We make another. He places a bet. We place another. Then we see who really rolls the best numbers. That's all. How can you be so casual about this, Mal seethed? Don't you see what he's doing? Yes, he's forcing us to be progressive, too. I must say he's making all of this far more interesting, isn't he? Brizek said a bit too cheerily. He's ruining everything, the old man shouted. He cannot be allowed to succeed, or he puts in peril all that we are attempting to do. Bears don't innovate. Perhaps, Brizek ventured, Shin really isn't a bear. Maybe he's merely a clever man, up to the challenge. No, he's not, Mal bellowed, and I want him stopped. Suddenly, a stream of profanities erupted from the chairman. Flagging Shin, son of a sow, what the slag have you done? Brizek blinked in mild shock. Normally, slag was the throwaway bits left over from smelting, except the way the army said it their tone turning it into the foulest word in the world, and one rarely uttered. As for son of a sow, oh, that was just everyday muttering for Mal. But what surprised the good doctor even more was Mal's excessive fury. The problem is, Brizek ventured, do you realize what he's done, Mal spat. Brizek sighed, tell me. He's undone us. Think about it. If his little procedure for recording the names of all the residents goes throughout the entire world and soldiers can race to a person's house within minutes, Brizek slowly nodded. Ah, I see. A few people who turn up missing may actually be somewhere else doing something else for us. Interesting, he mused. I suppose this is why most people don't play dices against themselves. Gets hard to remember which side you really want to win. We win, Mal shouted, then looked perplexed. I mean, we being, wait. The good doctor smirked. One side will always win, and the other will always lose. Which half of you do you want to succeed? Mal exhaled loudly and started a quiet monologue, consisting mostly of words beginning with, as far as Brizek could discern, the letter S. Slagging stupid son of a sow's shins. Brizek let him nat natter on like a mad old woman before he cleared his throat. Um, whenever you're ready, I may have a solution. Mal shut right up. You realize that Shin's recording procedure will only fly in villages that are attacked, Brizek pointed out. After terror, the people are willing to forfeit all kinds of freedoms to ensure their security. That's something we may want to remember, by the way. But everyone else will see this as a further intrusion of the forts, especially when they see how quickly a soldier can be standing at their door. I'm listening, Mouse said, hope lighting in his eyes. The world is still conflicted, grateful the forts are helping, but also wary of their magistrates and enforcement men losing power. Something like this happened before, back with Quirrell the First. Mal's eyes grew bigger. Exactly. Coral instituted a registration program when the first garters were running away. Everyone had to tell him where they moved to and into what house so that he could track families and bring the garters to justice. Ha! He boomed. We can knock this down by saying parents resorting to quarrel like tendencies. He clapped his hands loudly and rubbed them together. Perfect. Brizek massaged his chin thoughtfully. However, there is some merit to knowing the names of people in each house. In the past, Gadaman occasionally had problems finding out exactly where someone lived. The messenger services don't even know where most people live. Using Perrin's system, we'd have ready-made maps of every single village in the world. Mal held up a finger and paused as if stuck in thought. The good doctor tried not to smirk at his companion's internal quandary. Perhaps Mal was trying to figure out which side, the administrators or the garters, should win this toss of the dices. 
A smile formed on Mal's face. He'd made a decision as to this round's winner. Record only the last names. That will make the forts feel better, knowing who lives there, but no first names or the number of people in the household. That should keep the citizens from feeling we're going too far. Brzezek nodded. Both sides were going to win. That was always the way Mal played things, until he won. He never gave up. If he sensed he was losing at something, be it an argument or a government, he'd keep pushing and going and changing the rules until he was winning again. Nico Mal had to win. There was nothing else for him in the world except to possess it all. He saw himself as a high-minded and intelligent leader, doing the world a service by demonstrating how animal-like it was and studying its responses. But that was all a cover, because Mal, at his heart, was simply the most competitive man in the world. Everything he ever did was about proving he was better than anyone else. It was childish, really, Brezak considered, as Mal began to blather on about how he was turning the tables on Perrin Shin's so-called brilliant ideas. The doctor wondered if, as a boy, Nico had been on the small side, abrasive with others, but arguably the smartest boy in the school. And despite his excellence, he was overshadowed by the tall, handsome, charming boy that every peer and teacher couldn't help but admire. That would explain a lot, Brzezek decided, as Mal ranted about the arrogance of army officers. It wasn't too difficult to figure out who Mal saw and hated as Mr. Popularity. People think competition is a good thing, Brzezek mulled as Mal now stood up and gestured wildly about how he would always prevail, no matter what tactics Shin threw at him. But at what point does friendly competition develop into maniacal despotism? Maybe, Brzezek decided, that's like asking when tumbling pups become ravaging wolves. When's our man going in? Mal barked, shaking Brzezek from his thoughts. With the fifty new soldiers, Brzezek sighed later this week, he'll find our quiet man, discover what he knows, and guarantee that Shin fails, I promise you. Barker didn't even need bacon. He saw the man and was over the fence in less than a minute. Well done, well done. Something new tonight, alongside. Hysimum had been very busy for weeks, sewing constantly and boasting to her friends that the security of Edge rested squarely on her shoulders. Her son-in-law needed her talents, and she couldn't be bothered with anything else until her duty to the army of Idumea was completed. One afternoon, Perrin came home from the fort for midday meal, annoyed. If one more of your mother's sewing friends ambushes me again, I may have to issue a mandate that no woman over 40 years of age is allowed to talk to me. Why? What do they want? Mari asked. To help secure Edge? What in the world is your mother saying? Mari laughed. I'm not sure, but she said she'll be done by the end of the week with your project. Good, Perrin said, calming down. We'll test them early next week, then. I'm rather excited. Well, I was too, but not any more, Perrin grumbled. The first men to test the system have already been decided. Who? Perrin groaned. You? Mari squealed. It's about time. What happened? Through clenched teeth, he said, Xena's happened. Mari didn't, didn't get to hear anything more about that until Shem came by later that afternoon with the message that Perrin would be home late again. That's when Mari found out what occurred at the fort that morning. He had no choice, Shem grinned at her. He had to accept. I know you've wanted to watch him run, so I set him up. Shem, once again, you've solidified your status as my favorite soldier. So how did you do it? Wrestling, Shem said, twisting his own muscular neck as if it were still kinked. You know how he likes to motivate us by insisting that no one is stronger, tougher, or faster than him? Well, he brought 50 of us into the training arena for a sparring challenge, and I stepped up to be the first to take him on. Mari shook her head. I've told you, take him on after the eighth men. 
That's when he starts to get tired and someone as large as you will have a fair chance at beating him. I didn't want to beat him, although I was close, he sighed wistfully. This close. Then there I was again, flat on my back, staring up into that cocky grin of his. But I knew I had him. I stood up, looked him in the eyes and said, you know, sir, there's one way to prove you're really the strongest soldier. And I find it interesting that of all the soldiers in the fort, you're the only one who has yet to participate in it. Mari grinned and clapped her hands. Perfect, Shem. Well, he folded his arms and gave me that haughty look of his. What are you going on about, Zenas? His impersonation was good enough that Mari snorted. I'm talking about the races to edge, sir, I told him. Even Captain Karna has run in two of them, but you never leave your horse. I even folded my arms to try to look as intimidating as him. So he raised that angry eyebrow of his and said, I'm on a horse so I can track progress, Corporal, and make sure none of you cheat. So I told him, oh, I don't think that's the entire reason, sir. I think you know you to lose. Mari covered her mouth briefly before she said, oh, Shem, you're the bravest man in the fort. He shrugged modestly. About half the soldiers took several large steps backward at that point. So then the major glared at me and said, I don't raise you soldiers because I don't want to humiliate you. No one's faster than me, Zenas. You know that. Mari kept giggling. That's when the ooze began and the rest of the men took a large step backward. So I looked at your husband in the eye and I said, check the race posting, posting sir. No one can beat me. I think I'm ready for you, so I challenge you to a race. No teams, just you against me. We'll see who the strongest soldier really is. What else could he do? Mari burst out laughing. Brilliant! Shem laughed too. Then he said it'd be his pleasure to humiliate me. He's sure he'll humiliate you? Mari rubbed her hands together. Oh, I can hardly wait. Shem chuckled. I, I kind of hope he's behind me chasing. Even though it's been several weeks since he accused me of being a garter, Mari, he sometimes still scares me near to death. Perrin passed several carpenters and nodded amiably as they waved to him. His mother-in-law wasn't the only person on his latest project. He stepped into the shadow blocking the afternoon sun, looked up, and grinned. Now that they were nearing completion, his latest ideas looked even grander and more imposing than when he first sketched out their dimensions late one night in his study. For the past several weeks, a small army of lumberjacks, carpenters, and craftsmen had been building 12 tall covered towers, just like this one, in strategic locations and edge. Each was a wooden structure rising higher than any of the surrounding trees and capable of holding two men who could hoist signal banners during the day or light a fire in a metal cauldron on the roof for nighttime mornings. The furthest tower was a quarter of a mile south of Edge, along the main road to Mount Seen and Idumea. Additional towers surrounded the village and sev several were within, including one at the center of the village green. With the addition of 50 soldiers that were coming from Idumea, Perrin had calculated there would be more than enough men to operate the towers day and night. The view from the top was remarkable. At first, the carpenters were frightened to build to such a height, until Major Shin took all of them to his command tower to show them that the air was still breathable as it was on the ground. Within days of the first towers reaching their final height, he had the opposite problem, keeping people off of them. Everyone wanted to see how well their back gardens could be viewed and how much of their neighbors they could spy on. It didn't matter that the ladders going up through the middle weren't yet complete. Daring Edger simply climbed up the lattice work on the side, just as the builders had done. Perrin had to implement a strict rule. Only workers allowed on the towers and when they were completed, only the soldiers assigned to them. Security of edge, specially trained men, potential hazards to the citizens and all that. Since it came from the major, 
the man who protected Edge so well that the only deaths from the recent raid were those who that most directly affected him, Edgers obeyed. Usually. Perrin held his breath as the ladder in the middle was heaved into place by several burly men, to the cheers of another dozen or so citizens watching the progress. Tomorrow, each tower, nearly completed, would also be equipped with Hysimum's creations, which he was on his way to inspect, long banners that could be raised in a moment's notice to signal the fort. Red banners would mean garter activity had been spotted. Yellow, fire. Blue, official visitors were on the way, and orange, the chief of enforcement, requested backup assistance. Perrin imagined the orange one would be going up most frequently, since a couple of enforcement officers revealed to him they were losing a bit of confidence in the chief, and could they sign up to be soldiers? The whine of an 18-year-old broke into his admiration of his creation. Are you sure three carts are necessary, sir? asked one of the privates waiting behind him, pulling a wooden cart. The other two privates, also manning small wagons, usually pulled by mules, looked at him with warning in their eyes. It was rare that anyone questioned the judgment of Major Shin. But fortunately for the new soldier, the Major was in an excellent mood. Edge was becoming more secure every day, and he was finding it easy to smile again. Believe me, private, cloth can weigh a great deal. Don't worry, this is really quite an easy assignment, but if you prefer, we need latrines dug by each of the towers to service the men working there. No, sir, I'm sorry, sir, this assignment is just fine. Oh, I'm so glad you feel that way. A few minutes later, they arrived in front of Heisman Pato's house, and Perrin groaned. He'd been dreading the assignment more than his three privates. He knew she'd make this complicated. And there they are! His mother-in-law squealed as the crowd of neighbors turned and applauded. And you know what an event like this calls for, right, Perrin? Cake! No, Mother Shin, he rubbed his forehead and mumbled, because he knew she'd never listen to him. It does not call for cake. But already the three young privates had happily abandoned their carts and were being escorted to a table by Hysimum's gray-haired friends. No, 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 Perrin cringed. First we need to... Oh, Perrin, look at them, so pale and skinny. Perrin squinted at the three soldiers, each of them a different hue of brown, two of them a bit on the hefty side, and wondered if Hysimum needed her eyes examined. Let them have cake first, she said, patting his arm. It's your favorite, by the way, she sing-songed at him. And I won't tell Mari that you had dessert before dinner. It really would have appeared tyrannical to drag the three soldiers away from the cake table in front of the crowd of 60 people enjoying the impromptu afternoon party. Instead, Perrin sighed and walked into his mother-in-law's house, to inspect the folded banners stacked in tall piles throughout her gathering room. Once he did, he was glad he was alone. Since when did I request black, white, green? Oh, and here's purple. Of course, so cheery, isn't it? He grumbled. To announce the first flowers of the season, perhaps? This is so ridiculous. He stopped, stunned as he discovered the next unasked-for banner color. Oh, she can't be serious. And he counted the folds. Twelve. She actually expects me to... Oh, Mari, where are you? So what do you think? He heard his mother-in-law's voice ringing behind him. These, he pointed to the stacks of red, blue, orange, and yellow that he had requested, look perfect. Strong, lightweight cloth that will easily catch the breeze and as long as wide and wide as we discussed. The army of Idemia and I firmly thank you, Mrs. Pato. But Mother Pato, this, this. Oh, there's always new emergencies coming up, aren't there? She said as she came over to straighten a stack of additional banners. I decided to anticipate the need and make you extra colors now. But honestly, Mother Pato, this one? He held up the shocking banner. 
It unfurled before him, the tapered end unrolling onto the ground to reveal its full 20-foot length. He flopped the wide end over his shoulder and held out the banner. Pink? With dark pink stripes, no less? He shook it at her. What kind of emergency in the world would require a pink striped banner? Attacking flower sellers? Belligerent out-of-work gestures? Hysamum put her hands on her full hips. Or the arrival of special entertainment at the amphitheater. Or new goods at the market from Idemia. Perrin, I got that cloth at a very good price. You'll see that on the bill. It hangs so lovely from a pole. Pink! Perrin, I'm beginning to suspect you don't like the pink. I didn't ask for this! He tried to keep his bellow down. Hysamum blinked at him. But surely you'll think of some use for it. Look at the dye job. Really quite lovely. Perrin opened his mouth to give his opinion of said dye job when it, his three, he saw his three privates coming into the gathering room, finishing off their bits of cake. They stopped when they saw their commander with the pink striped banner cascading in front of him. It is lovely, sir, one of them said bravely. Compliments your black hair. All three soldiers snorted. The only thing that preserved their lives at that moment was the arrival of Hysamum's sewing friends to come ooh and ah over the banners and to finger the pink striped one that Perrin couldn't seem to find a way to put back onto the pile. Nearly an hour later, as the privates trudged with their heavy carts into the compound of the fort, Major Shin gestured to Captain Karna. In these carts, you'll find the four colors of banners we requested, as well as a few others that can be put into storage. But at the very bottom of that cart, and he pointed to the offensive one, you'll find a color of banner for which I will never, ever find a use. Dispose of those discreetly. And how will I know which banners those are? You'll know, Perrin said heavily. Lieutenant Heth brushed down his horse in the stable and couldn't help but smile. He hadn't owned a horse in years, and the dappled gray was steady and strong. Everything was shaping up exactly as he dreamed. His old guest bedroom was the same one as he'd left it years ago, and the food was even better than he remembered. Or maybe it was because after so much dormitory food, each meal with an oddly persistent gray tinge to it, Anything else tasted like a harvest day feast. Even his new companion was tolerable, another newly graduated lieutenant with extra training provided by Administrator Gadaman. That was the only downside, the ever-hovering presence of Gadaman. All training was done at night, and Heth wondered if the Administrator ever slept. Maybe he didn't, which would explain his pasty skin, bloodshot eyes, and permanent sneer. But he could put up with Gadaman because of what was coming next. Using Lieutenant Walakaya was Brizak's idea, but with Mal counting on his failure, there would be Heth. And then there would be everything else. Heth didn't notice the scruffy looking man wheeling in the bales of hay until he came up right next to him and patted the mare on her flanks. Nice looking animal. Must have come from the stables at pools. Of course, only the best for Mal's officers. Or, he added in a whisper, for the son of a king. Heth stopped in mid-brushing and looked over to the man next to him. Dorman, he gasped at his younger brother, who he hadn't seen in over a year. Shh, Dorman whispered. Just like you, I've changed my name. Call me Ted. Ted? Took me a while to find you again. In King Oren's former mansion? Phew, this is plucky. I don't know what game you're playing, but I have a feeling you don't know all the rules. Ted? Obviously, Mal knows who you are and placed you here. But for what reasons, I can't quite fathom. Intriguing, though, how long are you planning to stay here? Ted? Yes, Ted. What, it's better than Heth? Is that a first or last name anyway? What are you doing here? Heth finally hissed. 
He looked frantically around, but the other stable hands were too busy with their work to think of anything about a lieutenant talking with the straw man. I've come to say goodbye, Dorman Ted whispered. At first I wasn't sure why, but now seeing you in that uniform and in these stables, well, I think it's obvious. When I last saw you, I said I'd never see you again. Come to break your promise, doorknob Ted? Heth was recovering from his shock. Dorman didn't show any reaction to the jab. Have you ever given any thought to what I talked to you about? The writings? Heth rolled his eyes. Door girl, of course not. So many better things to do. He straightened his uniform jacket proudly. Dorman didn't even look at it. And what are you going to do? Take back our old mansion? I'm not going to take it, Dormouse. It's going to be given to me. Given, Dorman repeated quietly. Why? Heth chuckled quietly. Wouldn't you like to know? But you won't until you hear about it, and then it'll be too late, and not one of those rooms will be for you, Dorfer Brains. His brother nodded slowly. None of those rooms will be for you either, Heth. I have an idea of what you're about to do, and I promise it will fail. I'll never see you again because you'll be dead. Heth scoffed. You've always been so serious and dull, and you have no idea what I'm about to do. Dorman sighed. Please, son of Orin, change your mind. It's not too late. I know of things you simply can't imagine. Everyone here thinks they know, but, well, take this for instance. Son of Orin, what color is the sky? Heth rolled his eyes. Blue. You didn't even look, did you? You just assumed, you know, but did you actually look at it? With a dramatic sigh, Heth glanced out the stable went, open stable doors to see the tiny patch of sky available. See? Blue. Right there. Dorman pressed his lips together. That's precisely right, isn't it? See the part that you want to see? Assume it applies to everything else and stop thinking. But it's all wrong, son of Orin, he whispered. So much is wrong. Please come with me and let me show you. The door, Dorman Head, Heth said, gesturing to the stable exit. I've had enough, and I'm due in for dinner soon. You're sloppy, and it will kill you, Dorman warned in a low voice. The only way for you to have the High General's mansion is if there's no more High General. Heth swallowed, realizing that as vague as he thought he was, he obviously wasn't enough. I'll miss you, son of Warren, Dorman said bleakly. I'm not sure why, though. Maybe I'll miss the relationship we could have had. If only you'd come with me, but I suppose not. Goodbye, then, Lieutenant Heth. Heth stared after him as he slinked out of the stables. Deadhead Ted, he shouted, but Dorman didn't even turn around as he pushed the empty straw cart away. You're quiet for once, Lieutenant Zack commanded, as he commented, as he and Heth ate their dinners in an anteroom to the main dining room. Mal always ate alone, poring over pages of notes that were spread over the king's massive banquet table. His guards ate at small tables in attached rooms with a clear view of the chairman constantly at work, securing but not interfering. Sorry, Heth said absentmindedly, cutting a steak into small pieces in the proper manner of a future king only a little distracted. It was the flash of motion that he saw out of the corner of his eye that saved his hand. He withdrew it nearly too late as Zat's fork came down on it. What was that for? Heth exclaimed as he examined his nearly tined hand. There was a slight scratch mark on it and a thin line of blood where the fork caught him. That's what happens to the distracted, Zat pointed at Heth's hand. Failure. You're lucky you have such fast reflexes, but I don't want to nearly escape death, Heth. I plan to succeed where no one else has, and if I don't think you'll be the best partner, I'll tell Gadaman tonight. Heth nodded, grudgingly apologetic. You're right, you're right, I'll be more focused. Completely focused, Zat emphasized. You'll not ruin this for me. Nor for me, Heth said with a solid glare. So what is it? 
Zat asked, stabbing his steak with his fork and tearing off a piece with his teeth. As your partner, I should know everything in order to keep you centered on our mission. Heth grumbled. Just had an unexpected visitor this afternoon. From your past, Zat tore off another chunk of meat. Yes, someone I thought was gone. We're to eliminate all connections with the past, remember? Zat chewed noisily. I had, but this person found me, not the other way around. Uh-oh, Zat sneered as he swallowed. How much did you owe him? Zat paused, trying to think of how to... Heth paused, trying to think of how to avoid discussing his brother. Dorman had seemed different. And, once again, Heth had been more interested in insulting him than in finding out anything about him. It was obvious Mal couldn't use him, but the chairman wouldn't believe that. Besides, if Mal used Dorman, that'd be competition for his mansion. And the last person in the world Heth would share that mansion with was his brother. He'd sooner allow the Shin family to move in, if any of them survived. Four slips of silver, Heth eventually said. He forgot I repaid him last year. They always do, Zat said, shoving the rest of the steak in his mouth. Anything else, he tried to say without dropping bits of meat. Nope, he's gone. Especially when I showed him the only silver I'd give him was my long knife. Zat nodded in approval. Dying to use it, aren't you? That I am, Heth said, stabbing his steak. That is the end of the chapter. Thank you.